I'm Jules Souza, and I'm a professor at Port University and the head of the Underwater Systems and Technologies Lab. Today, I'll be talking about robotic vehicle systems for ocean exploration. And by doing this, I'll be discussing the motivation for developments in reliable AI for marine robotics, Remaro. This is an outline of my presentation. So I'll start by discussing ocean challenges. Then I'll describe what we've been doing in our lab. And before that, I'll discuss why ocean robotics is so challenging. And finally, I'll go into operations and future developments. This is the reason why we are here, the blue planet. This is a beautiful picture, but it's somewhat misleading. And this is the naked reality. So this sphere represents all of Earth's water, which has approximately 860 miles diameter. The smaller sphere, sphere represents fresh water. So it's a blue planet, but there's a thin blue layer. This is even more worrisome because of ocean conservation and because of the fact that we still don't know much about the ocean. Walter Monk put it this way, the 20th century was a century of undersampling. And the fact is that we don't know much about the ocean still. For example, energy balance, we have several force, we have forcing coming from wind, from the sun, from the moon, and then we have energy dissipation in the ocean. And for example, internal tides account for a significant percentage of energy dissipation in the ocean. These are related to internal waves that can top something like 150 meters. These happen underwater and you don't get to see those at the surface. Still very interesting. Another uh, interesting curiosity, uh, ocean dynamic topography. So if you look at the Atlantic Ocean and if you take a cut uh, from the South Pole into the North Pole, uh, when you cross the Gulf current, you see that the surface of the ocean varies by something like 90 centimeters. Another challenge, oxygen, uh, oxygen minimum zones, which are growing and impact fisheries and uh, other uh, industries. And this picture here displays the skeleton of currents uh, in the ocean. And then if you go into biology, it becomes even more interesting and challenging. Studies over time established key principles. All life energizes its energy from the environment and some chemical building blocks are found in all known life in the environment in which an organism lives, shapes its defining characteristics. There are over 2 million known animal species but there may be up to 18 million additional species in the ocean. For microbes, there are likely hundreds of millions of different species. And if you weigh all microbes, they weigh more than all human mankind. So this is why ocean observation is quite challenging. And let me talk about some of the observation challenges. For example, follow a molecule of carbon dioxide from here to here on a scale of hours to months to eventually years. So we need to go about coordinated synoptic observations on large spatial scales. We need to talk about persistent observations and go from the micro to the meso scale. This cannot be achieved without coordinated observations performed by autonomous underwater, surface, air, and space robots. The, the oceans are very remote and challenging, largely unknown, no navigation aids and no refueling stations, and these are also communications challenged. Now, a few words about why is ocean robotics so challenging? What you have here is a diagram representing one of our autonomous underwater vehicles. It's a torpedo-shaped uh, vehicle with one propeller 
and four fins to control it in the vertical and horizontal plane. Has a computer system, has a DVL, a Doppler velocity log, and an inertial measurement unit for navigation. Has an acoustic modem for underwater communications and an antenna for above water communications, Wi Fi, GPS, GSM, and Iridium. And what are the challenges? Energy storage, energy harvesting, interoperability, being able to talk with other vehicles. Radio communications in GPS are available only at the surface. Underwater communications, you can use acoustics and rates are up to something like 10 kilobits per second in that order or optical, much faster, but short range. Navigation, if you really need precise navigation, you have to use very expensive IMUs and DVLs or otherwise you have to re uh, rely on external aids, periodic resurfacing for GPS fix or cooperative navigation. In terms of payloads, these are quite limited. And now people are talking about docking stations, which are pretty much like gas stations for submarines. And now let me briefly describe what we do in our lab at Port University. So we've been designing, building, and deploying autonomous underwater surface and their vehicles for networked operations. And we've also been developing the software that enables all of these assets to work together as a team. And this is our vision for a sustained presence in the ocean. You need lots of different uh, assets. And there are lots of different types of interactions. For example, mixed initiative interactions, meaning operators in the planning and control loops. Vehicles may come and go, the same thing with the operators. There's the issue of scalability. Now we know how to operate 10, 15 vehicles. But what about 100? What about 1,000? We have been using vehicles as data mules. There's the issue of distributed computations. We also have been using vehicles to launch and recover other vehicles. And uh, in our vision, we would like to treat all of these assets as a system that has properties that are a function of the vehicles, a function of the communication networks, and a function of the interactions that you establish over this. So we want the system to have organization-like properties. This is not PowerPoint engineering. So we've been developing the tools and technologies to achieve this goal. These are some of our vehicle systems, quite diverse. Uh, most important, these vehicles use the same software and they share some of the computational hardware. They are interoperable, interoperable, meaning that they can talk to each other. And we have quite exotic vehicles, for example, flying modem. And we've also been playing with CubeSats. This is our workhorse, the light autonomous underwater vehicle, two versions, upper water column, endurance 50 hour plus in mapping. And this is how you operate it. Very simple. You just need to make sure that there's water there. And we've been developing the open source LSTS software toolchain, which is in use in over 20 countries. We have Dune running on board. We have IMC, which is our protocol for communications. So all nodes in our networks like IMC. And then we have Naptus, which is our uh, command control and communications framework that runs off board. In terms of operations, we've been operating in lots of different places. We've been organizing large scale exercises. We have deployments from shore, from ship, or from manned submarine. We have over one day of operations per year. In 2018, our UVs did over 4,000 kilometers underwater, and it over, in our UEVs did over 200 flights. And now let me briefly describe some of these operations. In 2014, we went to South Portugal, to Southern Portugal, to basically track some fish. So these were marked with satellite tags. 
that worked like this. So these guys would come to the surface and the tag would broadcast the position of the fish in real time. Then we use that position to track the uh, sunfish with multiple surface and underwater and uh, air vehicles. The idea was to measure environmental parameters close to their tracks, basically to try to understand what they were doing and why they were doing it. These are some pictures. And what you see here is basically a depiction of what we were doing there with uh, multiple assets from different teams contributing different tools and technologies. Uh, here we had onboard liberation on our AUVs. So we were using T-Rex that interacted with the onboard software Dune and plans were generated on board when new objectives were received or when there was an error executing some objective. And these are some of the scientific conclusions from this deployment. This was the up area here. And in this area, there was an inversion of currents. You can see this by looking at this SST data. So initially you had kind of warm waters here and then later on colder waters. You could see that uh, with our measurements. We also measured concentrations of salt uh, and uh, sunfish feed on salt. And we also studied how salt would basically travel in these locations. And basically, we uh, produced the conclusions that are uh, reported in this paper. In 2015, we went to the search to track whales pretty much along the same lines, but with a more complex uh, operational setup. So AUVs, ASVs, and UAVs, and an oceanographic vessel. Uh, in terms of uh, planning and execution control, we had a multi-domain framework. So we had AUVs and UAVs running T-Rex, and on board the ship, we had Eruptus, which was a planner that would generate high-level objectives that were sent to the AUVs and to the UAVs, either by acoustic communications or by set cons. And then we'd also get updates from the field using exactly set cons and uh, a cons. And this is a replay of some of these missions. Basically, what you see here are tracks of uh, AUVs, of UAVs, and how those were coordinating their motions to basically track a whale. Of course, the UAV is traveling much faster than the AUVs. We've also been uh, mapping the boom of the Dor River. You can see it here in this picture from the air. And uh, we've been doing this with uh, AUVs that zigzag along the edge of the boom. And this is what you see here. So you see the AUV zigzagging along the boom and there are several tracks here. For example, in track one, you see here in this panel, the salinity measurements, and you can see that there's a thin layer of fresh water at the surface. We've also been organizing the REP uh, environmental picture exercise in cooperation with the Portuguese Navy and CMRE since 2010. There are several focus areas. This is an invitation only exercise, and the exercise is targeted at uh, uh, operational experimentation and evaluation in an operational environment. Lots of different uh, assets. In 2019, we had over uh, 800 people, 10 companies, seven navies for two weeks, nine ships, and over 50 AUVs, ASVs, and UAVs. And now a few, uh, let me just talk about a few of these experiments. 
First one, uh, so entering the Southwest Valley, we have some very strong tidal driven currents. And so we had to come up with the optimal way of entering the estuary with an AUV. So we use dynamic programming techniques and not only we produce the optimal strategy, but we also run an experiment in which the AUV did exactly as expected in a mission with total duration of three hours and the predicted uh, time of completion was very close to the real time of completion. We also performed cross domain command control and communications uh, experiments with multiple AUVs with different acoustic modems with a surface vehicle with a communications gateway to bridge communications uh, between radios and acoustic uh, modems. We also had a quadcopter working as a flying modem that will be able to land and take off from water. And by doing that, we'll be able to communicate with submerged AUVs and then take data back to the operator. And these are some of the data products, side scan imagery and also multi-beam imagery. In 2018, we led this exploring fronts with multiple robots crews that took place in the Pacific, uh, approximately 1,000 nautical miles west of San Diego. Uh, we deployed from the Falkor and the cruise was funded by the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Our team had collaborators from all of these institutions and the goal was to demonstrate a novel multi-vehicle system capable of finding, tracking and sampling features of the ocean with adaptive spatial and temporal resolution. So we expanded our tool chain with Ripples, that is a communications hub for data dissemination and situation awareness. And we had a web-based mission control center that operated 24-15. So we had four shifts per day with operators in Porto and on board the RV Falkor. This was the mission control center in Porto with several fields. And this was the mission control center on board the RV Falkor. Uh, this basically summarizes what we did. In the background, you have an SST map. In red, you have uh, higher temperatures and in blue, lower temperatures. And superimposed on these, you have tracks of the AUVs color-coded by salinity. And there's a very nice correlation between the measurements that we did and the data that we got from remote sensing, in this case, SST. This is a 3D view of the front taken by our AUVs. We performed automated front detection and tracking. This was done with the wave glider, with the Falker, and then with AUVs. So you can see those guys here zigzagging along the front. We also performed high resolution coordinated sampling with the AUVs, the Falker, and UAVs moving information for a very precise characterization of uh, an area of the ocean. And now let me briefly talk about future developments. This slide was presented two weeks ago during a meeting organized by National Academy of Sciences in the US to discuss uh, ideas for the UN Decade of Ocean Sciences. And this is the vision that we presented there. Then again, multiple uh, assets collecting data that was ingested and assimilated into models. And then by looking at this data, uh, the idea is to be able to retask these vehicles to produce even better estimates and to understand what is going on in the ocean. So basically we were closing the sense, assimilate, predict and sampling loops. And uh, I think that this provides a good motivation for the need for reliable AI in marine robotics. Thanks very much.